As you come into the Albright Gallery, one of the first areas that you pass is the portrait gallery, and which makes sense because portraits was probably one of the first art pieces that we began to see in our country. They didn't have cameras and things like that back then, so the only way to get a likeness of a person was to paint them. Uh, the other thing we need to realize is that there were no schools for art for artists to go to or would-be artists, and so a lot of their craft was learned either with somebody else teaching them or with them kind of doing a little trial and error. And the first person that we came to, we were coming to today is Jeremiah Theus, who did these two paintings here. And as you notice, these paintings have a lot of similarities, okay? Um, if you look at the frames, the frames themselves are very nice pieces of art in themselves. And they were made by a uh, very renowned, I'm not sure what the man's name is, but a very renowned furniture maker back in that period of time. And, uh, but anyway, the two subjects is Colonel Daniel Hayward and his wife. And uh, you can see that the pictures could have hung together, they could have hung apart. You can also get an idea that he was a colonial person. You can see the hat here. You might notice the hands are missing. Normally, in early portraits, we did not do the hands. The hands took time. And so they usually are either off the picture or else they will be tucked away someplace as he has tucked his away. Uh, the other thing, a lot of times when Jeremiah Theus would come to the houses to paint, uh, he already had the pictures pretty much done, except for the faces, the last thing to put on. And you might notice the break right here that you see in the collar to do his head. And then here you might notice that the flesh colors are different here than they are in her face, which kind of leads us to believe that that is the case. So, um, and I always tell the girls this, I think this is kind of cool because you could, uh, you could see a whole bunch of people, dresses and things, and you could kind of pick out the dress that you were going to have your head put on top of, and hence you'd have your portrait. As you come into the gallery also, you might notice we have wall plates. And so if there's something that you're wanting to know, a lot of times the information is right there on the wall plate. These two paintings that we are looking at right now are, uh, the painter was Gilbert Stewart. And Gilbert Stewart is a famous name back in that part of history. I don't know that we would be that familiar with the characters here, the uh, Mackenzies, but um, the, the thing that you might notice that's different from the first two portraits that we saw is they had kind of like a plain background. Gilbert Stuart was a little bit more of a sophisticated artist, and he had gone to France and he had painted over there. And so you might notice that the backgrounds in these pictures have got a little bit more in them than what the first ones were that we saw, and his detail, his eye to detail. Uh, the other thing that we note about Gilbert Stuart is that people around him recognized his skill, and he was much sought after. He was sought after so much that it the painting that probably we know about Gilbert Stuart or we're the most familiar with would be the one of George Washington. And if you have a dollar bill and you look at your dollar bill, that is actually the one taken from Gilbert Stuart's likeness of George Washington. And <clears throat> it, it, you can again tell that these paintings probably hung together. Frames look the same and also you might notice that the characters are also looking at each other. The other thing about portraits is usually the eyes are directly looking at you. We were just talking about the dollar bill and the next portrait that we're gonna be talking about will be one of George Washington, although this one is not done by Gilbert Stuart. This is done by a man named Rembrandt Peel. And interestingly enough, it is done almost 100 years after the ones that we had seen before. You begin to see that the artist has got a little bit more sophistication when they are doing the uh, the coloring and stuff, and you also might notice that George is not looking directly at you, uh, which makes it a little bit different than the other portraits we've seen so far. Rembrandt Peel was a young man, as a young man, the person that he met when he was around 11 years old was George Washington. Throughout his life, he painted many paintings of him. We're thinking at least 19 or 20, and this was one of the last ones that he painted before he passed away. Rembrandt Peel, the name itself speaks artist. His father was an artist, so he grew up around paintbrushes and oil, and he knew, he knew his way around a canvas, I guess we could say. The other thing that's kind of interesting is his father was evidently very influenced by other artists, and so he named his children not only Rembrandt, 
but also Ruben and Raphael, and some of the names that we think of as the main artist. But you can imagine that a young kid who met George Washington, we have to realize George Washington passed away in 1799. This picture was not done until 1860. So he had been gone a number of years by the time that Rembrandt Peale painted this last one. But as a young child looking up at this man and hearing him give a speech, he was quite taken with him and obviously he influenced his entire life. As you notice, we are in front of a different type of painting than what we've been talking about, which is, this is considered a landscape. Landscapes began to kind of follow after portraits. And the gentleman that painted this particular landscape is a man named Bierstead. Bierstead is actually a German. He was, he was born in Germany. He did a lot of his artwork in Europe. And then he, he uh, migrated to the United States. And when he got over here, he began to practice his craft again. And he was noticed, uh, especially by people that um, were wanting people to settle in the western part of our country. And so he had his landscapes and everything. And one of the people that noticed him were people who worked for Union Pacific Railroad. And so it was like he was a calling card. A lot of times you would see his paintings on calendars, uh, which was something that most people had in their homes. And you might say that he was probably one of the artists that was responsible for people looking at pictures of these, these expansive places of, of landscape. And it kind of beckoned him. You might notice that Bierstead puts, he puts quite a bit of perspective into his picture. And he also makes things, I think, probably a little larger than life. As we look in this particular picture, you will notice the, the, how large the trees are. So it's almost like it was telling people, if you come west, look at all the resources that you will have. You can build your cabins and your houses. Here's a little tiny bear. So you can only imagine how big these trees would have been. There's water back here. But there's plenty of resources in order for you to start a new life. Uh, the other thing that you see in the landscapes that we didn't see in the portraits is you see perspective. And you can even see where this tree is kind of pointing back into the scene. And so it kind of draws the person into the scene as they're looking at the picture. Pierce said his process basically, he would go out, he would sketch the scene. And in this case, he was out in California. And then he would return to the city, like New York, and he would actually do the painting there. This is a pastel by uh, by Mary Cassatt, and she was a very famous painter, an American painter. Her time period, she was born in 1844 and died in 1926. It was an important time in our country, and uh, she, it was amazing that she became a, the famous painter that she did. She was born in Pennsylvania, and accepted to the Philadelphia School of Art at an early age and finished her high school years there. Her talent was recognized early and she had visited Paris with her family and decided that she would go to Paris and study art. And she did that at the early age of 22. Uh, she <coughs> was mentored by Degas who is a very famous French painter known for his ballerinas and ballet scenes. And uh, she was actually invited to uh, show her works in their exhibition in Paris. She became quite fond of the uh, Impressionist style of painting with their brush strokes, bright colors, and casual scenes rather than painting her uh, masters like she had done in school. And so we have a famous American artist and she lived out the rest of her life in Paris. She had no children of her own, never married, but on one visit, her brother and sister-in-law came to Paris and left their three children with her while they went to the south of France. From that time on, she became very fond of her nieces and nephews. And from that time on, she chose to paint mothers and their children or family paintings. This one that we have is a beautiful pastel and it is entitled Mother Looking Down, Embracing Both of Her Children. It was finished in 1908. 
There is another painting that is like a dual painting uh, in, done in oil that is hanging in the White House. It's a wonderful painting. I enjoy it so much, as many of our visitors do here in the museum. And I think it is one of our most lovely paintings. This is a beautiful painting by William Merritt Chase, and it's very important to our museum. A, a student of his was from St. Joseph, Missouri, and she traveled to Venice even to take lessons from William Merritt Chase and saw him working on this painting uh, while she was there taking lessons. She loved this painting. You see the Venice uh, Venetian Canal and the beautiful apartment with all its furnishings. She wanted this so badly that she asked him if we could perhaps in St. Joseph, if we could buy this painting. And he sent it to St. Joe to be on display at some of the uh, downtown stores. And she started collecting money through teas and bake sales. They had all kinds of fundraisers to raise money to buy this painting because they had already formed an art league in St. Joseph, Missouri. And so she ra tried and tried to raise money with her friends and it did not meet his price. So she was short, quite a bit short, and he was impressed with her uh, painting, also being a student. He allowed them to buy it for the lesser price. So we have this beautiful Venetian balcony. You can see the Canal of Venice, the boat there, the Venetian boat. It's also a very rich apartment, showing the furniture, the uh, fl floorings, and also the elephant here. Shows that this family was a traveling family and probably very wealthy. So that is our first painting, bought by the Art League in St. Joe, Missouri, and we're very proud of this painting, Venetian Balcony. Okay, so this is the corner of the Wyeth family. First, we have N.C. Wyeth. He was the father of these three artists that we're gonna be seeing soon. Um, he was an illustrator, so he is featured in many illustrated books of his time period. This one is called Stern and Defiant. It was painted in 1920. It was a commissioned painting for the book, The Courtship of Miles Standish by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Um, it is a direct quote from the book. We have the pilgrims, the defiant Indian, and the snakeskin arrow quiver, which is his way of saying he has had enough. Um, this is a really great painting that shows light and shadow. He was a master of storytelling, which is a personal favorite of mine. His children, uh, four of his children, also became artists. We have Andrew Wyeth, who was a famous artist. Um, he was famous for his seascapes. We also have the sister Henrietta Wyeth, lesser known of the Wyeth siblings, and Jamie Wyeth, also seascapes and uh, beautiful watercolor paintings. This artist is Robert Henry. Uh, he's a Pennsylvania artist, worked in the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and um, he would take his vacations in Ireland where he would paint portraits. This is dark Bridget Lavelle. He painted Bridget Lavelle all throughout her life when he would visit her in Ireland. Um, so we have many paintings that show her growing up and also the expanse of this artist's lifetime. He painted very quickly with soft brush strokes, and it was said that he would paint a painting in 15 minutes. I don't think that's true, but I believe that he was a fast painter. This is the artist Deborah Butterfield. She makes um, sculptures that are anything from small like ours to larger than life size. Her subjects are almost always horses. She feels a great connection with horses. And so they are all personalities of hers and her friends, though she does not name them. Um, her work can be seen in many museums across the United States and the world. Though they look like wood and natural objects, they are actually mostly made of bronze. Some have been uh, cast, 
though some are kept in the original form of the wood and mud and things that she uses to make her sculptures. This artist is Wayne Tebow, and the title is Man Seated, Man Sitting Back View. It was painted in 1964. The gallery of the Albright Art Gallery opened in 1966. Um, and so Wayne Tebow, his exhibition was the very first in the Albright Gallery before it became the Albright Kemper Museum of Art. Um, Wayne Tebow is a California artist, and many of you will recognize his cake paintings and other desserts. But he also did some figurative work, including this exhibition. Man Seated Back View is um, kind of atypical to a lot of the rest of his work, but it does see the subject more as an object. If you look closely, it looks like a rainbow of colors, where when you back up, it's very um, subtle. Also, the composition is interesting in how he is centered side to side, but higher in the frame than you would typically see if it was perfectly centered. Uh, Wayne Tebow is still living today. He works at the University of California and uh, is a very important artist in our collection. We are in the Western Art Gallery, and this is one of our most famous paintings in the gallery. This is a Thomas Hart Benton that is entitled Custer's Last Stand. It was done in uh, 1945. Uh, fifth graders, you can look up the history of Custer's Last Stand. It was the Battle of Bighorn in southwestern Montana. And as you can tell, the numbers of the uh, soldiers to the Native Americans is not an even number. One of the things that Thomas Hart Benton always did was um, to draw your eye into the painting, he used a geometric shape. And I'm sure that you can see the uh, triangular shape that pulls your eye into the painting. The other thing is there's an organic shape in this painting. If you look at the top of the spear, you will see a white buffalo, which was very important to the Native American Indians. One of the interesting parts of uh, Thomas Hart Benton's process is that he always sculpted small figures and arranged them before he actually did the painting. And he is our Missouri artist, and you can find his work in the Capitol in Jefferson City, Missouri, and also at the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri. This is another painting in our Western Art Gallery done by uh, the artist Olaf Wighorst from Denmark. And as you can tell, this painting is all about the horses. And he was, uh, he was a stunt rider and was very fascinated with horses. As you look at this, it feels like the horses are gonna run right over you and he put them in the foreground, but the uh, perspective and the, the shape of the legs and the movement of them give a lot of uh, activity to this painting. Uh, compared to some of the other things that we look at that seem very uh, flat, this one you can almost smell the dust and feel the sound. Another interesting fact about this painting, it was commissioned by the Western Tablet Company of St. Joseph, Missouri. It was reproduced for years on the cover of the stationary tablets that were used by school children. And this particular Kemper Albright Art Gallery is the original building is the home of Mr. and Mrs. William Albright, who started the Western Tablet Company. You will also, if you come to the museum itself, downstairs we have a mantelpiece with a sculpture of Big Chief, which was always on the Big Chief tablets, and this was the same company that commissioned this painting for their tablets.